On August 31st, the Standing Committee of China's 12th National People's Congress issued a decision that dictated the procedure by which the chief executive, the kind of governor of Hong Kong, was going to be selected. Since 1997, the chief executive has been elected by an election committee. And in 2007, China said that the chief would be elected by popular vote starting in 2017. But at the end of last month, Hong Kong learned something important about the nature of that, quote, election by popular vote. Here's the statement from the uh, Central Committee. The ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. Now, that nominating committee would be about 1,200 citizens, which means out of 5 million voters, about 0.024% of Hong Kong on the nominating committee. So Hong Kong will have a certain kind of democracy. There'll be an election where all citizens get to vote. But before the election, there's a nominating committee where the 1,200 get to vote. And to be allowed to run in the election, you're going to have to do really well in the nominating committee. That's the structure of that democracy. Now, of course, this has been criticized by people inside of Hong Kong. They look at the nominating committee and they say that nominating committee will be dominated by a pro-Beijing business and political elite. It will be non-representative and therefore will not be a democracy. Okay, now Hong Kong is not alone in structuring, quote, democracy like this. It's a little better than others, but not alone. Iran, for example, has an election every cycle. Citizens get to vote in that election, but the people who run in that election are determined by a guardian council. The guardians decide who get to run. To run, you must do well among the guardians, and the guardians are about 12 out of 50 million people in Iran. Or the Soviet Union had a similar structure. There was an election where the citizens got to vote, but the Politburo was responsible. Those commies got to decide who, in fact, was allowed to run in that general election. You had to do well by the Politburo to be allowed to run. So 19 people at the end got to decide for about 270 million people. If Hong Kong is not a democracy, then these are not democracies either. So what should we call them? We could call them like fake democracies, kind of like fake Steve, but you know, it's not quite as funny as that. I think we should call it boss tweed democracies. <laughs> boss tweed democracies. Boss tweed famously said, I don't care who does the electing as long as I get to do the nominating. <laughs> and what tweed was hoping for was this two-stage democracy where what we call, could call the Tweedies controlling the first stage. With the consequence, of course, this is obvious, that the government will be responsible to the Tweedies because they depend on the approval of those Tweedies. Now, you may look at this and you say, this is a little bit foreign. You know, this is Arizona. What are we talking about this stuff for? But of course, this structure of democracy is not just foreign. Look a little bit in our past. Think of the Old South in America. 1870, we enact into our Constitution a provision that says you can't deny the right to vote on the account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Amazingly. But for 100 years, okay, you're saying he's exaggerating, and I am, you're right. For 95 years, <laughs> there was a concerted effort to exclude African Americans from the right to vote. And no more, no place more ambitiously than, of course, Texas, which enacted by law, the all-white primary explicitly saying African Americans could not vote in the Democratic primary. So in the Old South, we had a general election where all citizens got to vote, but then we had a white primary where only whites got to vote. To run in that general election, of course, you had to do extremely well in the white primary. That was the structure of their democracy. And the consequence, not surprisingly, was a democracy responsive to whites only. All right, so you say it's foreign, it's a little bit old. Why is it relevant today? Do we have such a structure anymore today? There's no thing like this in America today. Would that it were so? Because let's look at democracy in America today. 
We take it for granted. It's an obvious truth. It can't be any way other than this, that campaigns are privately funded in America. Which means we've evolved a system where members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back to Congress or to get their party back into power. Michelle Nunn's campaign had this memo leaked from the Georgia Senate race, finding, describing how she needed to spend 80 percent of her time raising money. In October, she's allowed to reduce that to just 50 percent of her time raising money. Now, as they do this, as they dial for dollars from people they've never met across the country, they learn which buttons they need to push. B.F. Skinner gave us this image of the Skinner box where any stupid animal could learn which buttons it needed to push for its sustenance. This is a picture of the modern American congressperson. <laughs> as the modern American congressperson learns which buttons he or she must push to get the sustenance he or she needs to run the campaigns their party desires. They develop, thank you, as they do, they do this, they develop, as any of us would, a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do affects their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shapeshifters, as they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not in issues 1 to 10, but in issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. Then to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> So who are the funders in this system? Who are the funders, the relevant funders, the people who give enough to be counted when politicians think about which views they should shapeshift into? Well, if you look at the American political funding right now, I calculate the funders are about 0.05% of America. 0.05% that are being called. At most, that means about 150,000 Americans, which the internet tells me is about the same number of people as are named Lester in the United States, which is why at my TED talk I called the United States Lester Land. And after the decision by the Supreme Court in McCutcheon versus the FEC, that number's gonna fall, I think, to mo no more than about 35,000, which, as the internet tells me, is about the same number of people as are named Sheldon in the United States. So whether it's Leicester Land or Sheldon City, the point is a tiny, tiny fraction of the 1% dominate the first stage of elections in America, so that America is, once again, a two-step democracy. There is a general election where all us citizens get to vote. But there is now a green primary, where the funders of campaigns get to vote. And to run in that general election, you must do extremely well in that green primary. You don't necessarily have to win, there is Jerry Brown, but you must, on average, do extremely well. And so that means 0.05% play a role in an election which eventually will represent 313 million Americans. This has an echo in our past, because we have excluded, again, from a critical first stage in the election, an incredibly important slice of the American public. But you know, the thing about the white primary is at least it could say a majority of the people in those districts got to vote. But in the current New America, it's the tiniest fraction of the 1% who get to vote in that first election. So, we're not all totally excluded. Supreme Court was completely right when it said in Citizens United, the people have the ultimate influence over elected officials. Because after all, there is a voting election where we all get to participate. But we have that influence only after the funders have had their way with the candidates who wish to run in that general election. So they are excluded where it matters, in the nominating of our election process. And the consequence of this is a democracy responsive to the funders, and maybe only, don't tell my dean, but I want to cite some Princeton research here for a minute. Let me put that off the stage really quickly here. <laughs> Martin Guilins and Ben Page did the largest empirical study of policy decisions in the history, I think, of political science, of American policy decisions, trying to track what accounts for the decisions the government actually made. What they find in conclusion is when the preferences of economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, 
The preferences of average America appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy. This is Tweedism. And we can see how Tweedism is flourishing around the globe. Okay, now, you're thinking, this guy's at the wrong conference. <laughs> Who the hell does he think he's talking to? <laughs> because, of course, if we've got a green primary <laughs> where the funders get to vote, you guys are the funders. <laughs> you guys are the Tweedies, <laughs> right? And if you think of, you know, all the other Tweedisms around the world, you think, well, you know, Tweedies do okay, so who the hell is he trying to persuade here? But the reality is, it's not true here that the Tweedies do well. It's not true anymore. Francis Fukuyama, famous political theorist, in his recent writing, says, look, America's not a democracy. America's not an aristocracy. America's not a plutocracy. America's not even a kleptocracy. What America is, is a vetoocracy, a vetocracy. And the reason we've become a vetocracy is something about the way in which our government was framed by the framers of our Constitution and the way campaign cash has evolved inside that democracy. The framers gave us what they called a republic, by which they meant a representative democracy. Not a pure democracy, a representative democracy, but an incredibly complicated democracy. Complicated in the way that a Swiss watchmaker might think about putting together mechanisms to make different things work. So there's a constant series of checks and balances to make it so it's hard to get things done in our political system. But imagine taking this complicated Swiss watch and pouring onto it honey, <laughs> dripping deep into the mechanisms of this sweet Swiss watch. Because that is a picture of what this structure of funding campaigns means for the way this democracy does not work. Because given the tiniest number of people who are funding campaigns, what that means is a tiny, tiny fraction of that tiny number of people have the capacity to leverage their power to block reform. Let's celebrate with Microsoft buying this great company here, Minecraft. So block reform. And what that means is that there is no change, any change, that's going to be possible, whether from the left or the right. This is not a Democratic or Republican issue. Whether from the left or the right, change will fail. Whatever your issue is, it doesn't matter. Until we change how campaigns are funded, sane policy is not possible in America today. <clears throat> okay, now look. As the lawyer in the room, I know I'm not the smartest person in the room, right? But what drives me nuts is why this point isn't obvious to everyone. It's not rocket science. The tweedism of our current system does not profit you because you don't profit in a world where government can't function. The tweedism of this system is killing us because we have lost the capacity to govern here. We have lost the capacity to govern. We are a bus driver who has lost the steering wheel. <laughs> and a state which cannot be guided is a state that will crash. This is our future unless we find a way to change this fundamental corruption of a political system. So what should we do? Well, the first response you get when people raise this question, what can we do about the corrupting influence of money in policy, politics, is that we can't do anything. There's nothing to be done. Nothing to be done. Why? Because this institution has broken democracy. This institution, the Supreme Court, their decision in Citizens United has made it impossible to do anything without amending the Constitution. And what we know is we can't amend the Constitution. So this is impossible. Let's just go home. But if I'm allowed, let me say this is total bullshit. Total bullshit. <laughs> because we can change the way campaigns are funded through a simple statute. 
and we can pass a statute to change the way campaigns are funded by electing a Congress committed to that, and we can begin to push for a Congress committed to that by deploying a device, something like a super PAC here, to elect a Congress committed to fundamental reform, and that's precisely the thing that we just started this year, the May Day PAC, May Day as in the distress signal, to be a super PAC to end all super PACs by electing a Congress committed to fundamental reform. Now you say, wait, 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 you're going to use big money to end the influence of big money. And the answer is, yeah, that's a little bit ironic. But as Lincoln said, we need to embrace the irony. Okay, Lincoln didn't really say that, but okay. <laughs> The guy who said we were going to have a democracy that would be of, by, and for the people would have said that if he saw the way in which this influence <laughs> had evolved to corrupt exactly that design of a democracy. So we said we were going to try an experiment to see if it was possible to build a force powerful enough to elect a Congress committed to reform. We have a plan that has a pilot that we begin in 2014. We're going to run in a mix of races around the country, diverse contexts, Republicans and Democrats pushing for candidates, supporting for reform to see whether we can demonstrate voters will vote on the basis of this issue, and then gathering all the big data that's possible about these experiments that we're running in both ways to run campaigns and techniques for innovating and getting people to focus on this issue. We want to build the brief that will convince investors that it's possible to invest again in a democracy that is what this democracy is supposed to be. So we launched this PAC on May 1st, May Day, and we said we would raise a million dollars in 30 days. We raised a million dollars in 13 days. Then we said we got that matched. Six people came forward to match that million dollars. Then we said we would raise five million dollars in 30 days. And on the last day, Big reason was a tweet from this extraordinary person to his 7 million followers, which produced $750,000 to our campaign. As the fireworks were going off over Washington, D.C., we crossed the $5 million in 30-day mark and crowdfunded then, turns out now, a total of about $8 million. And if we can take the last step here to get the $5 million matched, and it's turning out this is a bigger if than I thought it would be, but okay. If we can get this $5 million match, then we will have the resources we need to run the experiment to demonstrate that Americans, it turns out, care about the corruption of their democracy and are willing to step up to elect governments that will do something about it. Now, it's not my job to be here to sell you on the idea of May Day, but it is my hope to get you to reflect on this one question, if not this, then what? What? We, especially we, in a technology space, we live in this constant state of denial about this problem. We assume away the most complicated bits. I listen to Eric Schmidt talk about the future, and I am as excited as anyone about the future he describes. But when he as an afterthought says, oh yeah, and then policymakers will fix the problem, I say there is a drunk grizzly bear at the center of your story, and what are we going to do <laughs> to wrestle it to the ground? Because this government is not going to solve these problems. There is no capacity at all to solve these problems until we force them to solve them in a sensible way, and we will not until we end this corruption. There is a denial about the place this institution has in making possible the hopefulness that Eric describes, in making possible. This is the problem. Now, when we were kids, we were proud of this democracy. We were proud of a democracy our parents gave us. It wasn't perfect, it wasn't perfectly just, and there were great moments of injustice in its past. But the world admired it, and so could we. So could we. But our kids are going to look back at us, and they're going to ask, how could we, how could we have let that die? How could you 
have let that die. Because if we could harness just 1%, one sliver of the talent that sits in this room, one thousandth of one percent of the wealth that sits in this room, we could fix this problem. We could fix this problem by 2016 as a gift to the next great president, whether it be a he or a she, the gift of a Congress that is not obsessively focused on how to make the tweeds in America happy. This is the moral question of our time. Can we reclaim a democracy? And as all of us know, and as I know, as well as anyone, that question revolves around one further question. We can only, if you will lead, if you will step up to the obligation that has been placed upon us by a series of mistakes and weaknesses that have taken from our children what we were given by our parents, a democracy to be proud of that can address the problems that all of us face to make possible the potential that Eric Schmidt promises. Thank you very much.